Thank you very much for joining us today for this symp International Symposium, 311, 12 years on, learn about Fukushima and the world today, create a nuclear you're free tomorrow. Uh, my name is Ayumi Fukakusa from FOA Japan, and I will be moderating today's event. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. So it will soon be 12 years since March 11, 2011, when the Great East Japan earthquake and subsequent disaster at Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant took place. Um, however, this nuclear disaster is still ongoing and the damages and effects are far reaching. At FOE Japan, in cooperation with various organizations and people, uh, we have been holding symposiums like this one every year. Uh, we are very concerned that the damage and realities of the nuclear disaster are gradually being forgotten. Many people lost the places that they call home, and many people are still living in evacuation shelters today. And so we have to ask ourselves, what have we learned from this nuclear disaster? And what should we pass on? And what kind of society do we want to build? We hope that at today's symposium, it'll be an opportunity for everyone to learn and to think about this and discuss about the current situation of the nuclear disaster and the global situation regarding nuclear power. This symposium is co-hosted by international environmental NGO FOA Japan, as well as international NGO Peace Boat. We also have participants joining us from, um, from online for today's event. We have about 400 participants that have signed up for this event uh, from both in person and online. And as I mentioned earlier, we have some guests joining from overseas. And for that reason, we will be utilizing the simultaneous interpretation function. And so if you are joining us on Zoom, if you go to the bottom of your screen, there should be a globe icon or an, a button that says interpreting. If you click on that, you will be able to choose the language you would like to listen in. If you are joining us in the venue today, uh, we will be um, playing Japanese audio. Uh, today's event will be divided into two parts. In the first part, Riko Muto and Miho Kumazawa will be giving keynote speeches, each for about 30 minutes. And in the second portion, we will the theme will be nuclear power and energy policy, and we will have some speakers from Japan and abroad. This event is uh, scheduled to end at 1 p.m. Japan time, but we do have a lot of speakers, and so we won't be able to take any breaks throughout the event, and I apologize that for that in advance. If you're joining us online, um, please feel free to grab a beverage and uh, relax while you listen. And also because of limited time, we will not be able to have a Q&A session during this event. If you are joining us on Zoom, please use the Q&A function to send in any comments or thoughts that you might have. If you would like to comment on something that one of the speakers has said, uh, please use this function to do so. So before we hear the keynote speeches, I would like to welcome Sumiko Hatakeyama, who is an executive committee member of Peace Boat, to uh, give some opening remarks. Uh, good morning. I'm Sumiko Hatakeyama from Peace Boat. Thank you very much for everyone joining us both offline and online. Next week marks March 11th, and it will be 12 years since the disaster took place. Uh, I visit Fukushima sometimes, not a lot, but I, I was able to go last month, and I visited Fukushima City and also Minami Soma. And since the disaster, I had been in contact with some people, after, and so I was able to meet with 
those organizations and people that I've been in touch with. And as we dis as I spoke with them, I felt that many uh, changes and progress has been made during these 12 years, but the damages and effects of the disaster are still ongoing. And in a sense, I felt that maybe they will never come to an end. As uh, I, Ayumi mentioned, there are still many people who are living in evacuation shelters and many people whose lives have been changed and many people who have experienced or are yet to experience the long-term mental and physical effects. And so I felt that there are so many different effects. On the other hand, if we look at the policy that the government has, uh, it's very frustrating to see that they are um, changing these policies to restart nuclear power plants using words such as GX to uh, change policy so that nuclear power plants can operate for 40, uh, for 60 years instead of 40. And even though we do not yet have a clear path to decommissioning nuclear reactors, uh, the government is promoting policies as if the nuclear disaster never happened. And without the consent of local communities, they are preparing to discharge contaminated water into the ocean. Uh, when I went to Fukushima, one resident mentioned that it's as if everything we've done for the past 12 years has gone to waste. It's been 12 years and it seems as though everyone has forgotten. It's like it never happened. And so I felt these words very deeply and feel responsible to continue the work. Today's symposium titled International Symposium 311, 12 Years On, Learn About Fukushima and the World Today, Create a Nuclear Free Tomorrow, is co-hosted by Peace Boat, which is an organization that informs the world about the horrors of nuclear weapons and advocates for transitioning away from all things nuclear. And also uh, our co-host is FOE Japan, and we've both been working hard to disseminate information and specialized knowledge about uh, these issues. So there's this issue of the nuclear disaster and energy policies. And the reality of the victim should always be kept at the forefront when we are having these discussions. In the first part of today's session, we are hearing from uh, Reiko Muto about the TEPCO trials and contaminated water and Miho Kumazawa who will speak about the 311 thyroid cancer trial. So we can learn about what these people are fighting for and as well as the fact that they have to continue to fight for these rights. And so I hope we can learn and think about and take away a lot from these uh, keynote speeches. And in the second part, we will hear from people around the world and Japan who are opposing nuclear power plants. I uh, have been involved with Peace Boat, which connects people from around the world by ship or boat for more than 10 years. And there are so many frustrating things happening in the world, but in order to keep hope alive and to continue to speak out, I think that it's very important to create, expand and strengthen connections with people around the world as individuals and to share our knowledge and experiences, which in turn expands our interests and strengthens solidarity and fosters support amongst us. I hope that this two, two and a half hour event, which is quite long, is an opportunity for us all to listen to the speakers and to think together about what we can do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Hatakeyama. Uh, so now I would like to move on to the keynote speeches. Our first speaker, Reiko Muto, is a joint representative of Idanren, the Liaison Committee for Organizations of Victims of the Nuclear Disaster, and she res resides in Miharu Town, Fukushima Prefecture. Since 2012, she's been working to hold TEPCO accountable as the chair of the Fukushima Nuclear Disaster Plaintiffs Group. Uh, Ms. Muto, over to you.
Oh, okay. Sorry, I'm now on the English channel. Apologies. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. Once again, March 11th is approaching. Soon it will be 12 years since the Fukushima nuclear accident. I am very angry and I feel disappointed and frustrated by the Kishida administration policies backtracking, moving back towards supporting nuclear power. At the same time, the damage and responsibility for the nuclear accident are becoming increasingly invisible. Today, I'd like to talk about the issue of the Alps treated water that is going to be discharged into the ocean this spring or the summer, and also the ongoing issue of the responsibility for the nuclear power accident. On January 18th of this year, the Tokyo High Court ruled that all defendants were not guilty in the first trial in the criminal case against former Tepco management for their responsibility in the Fukushima nuclear accident. This day in January, it was very cold and the plaintiffs had rushed to be there despite the biting cold wind in the morning. And they felt great frustration and indignation at this decision. 11 years after the 2012 criminal complaint by 1,324 Fukushima residents and 13,000 people nationwide, and after two unsuccessful prosecution attempts by the prosecutors and two decisions by the Public Prosecutor's Office, the mandatory indictment trial finally began in 2017. Over the course of 38 trials, numerous pieces of evidence regarding tsunami predictions and countermeasures have come to light. The process also brought to light the terrible situation and fate of the patients of the Futaba hospital when they were evacuated. This hospital is located four kilometers from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant and 44 patients died during the ev evacuation. Despite all of this evidence, the first trial in September 19 ruled that all of the defendants were not guilty. An appeal was held from November 2021 and concluded in June last year after the third trial. The Tokyo High Court rejected the on-site inspection of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, as well as any questioning of witnesses involved in the long-term evaluation and work to make the site watertight. These were all things that the lawyer acting on behalf of the, the accusers had applied for and which we had so earnestly hoped for. It was also rejected to use, they also rejected to using evidence from the TEPCO shareholders lawsuit. This, appealing, this appeal hearing was far from satisfactory in my opinion. The atmosphere in the courtroom that day was in stark contrast to that of the Tokyo District Court on July 13th last year, where the TEPCO shareholder lawsuit ordered former TEPCO management to pay 13 trillion yen for damages caused to the company. It's hard to believe that the same evidence had been used and the same former TEPCO management was being judged, when in one courtroom you had everyone except Te TEPCO's legal team, of course, standing up and applauding as the judge judges left, whereas in the other courtroom, everyone's faces were filled with anger and shouts of shame, shame on you, filled the room. The court's decision made me wonder to what extent the court really understood the reality of the damage caused by the nuclear accident or the severity and the harsh and horrible situation faced by the people who were evacuated by, from the Futaba hospital and to what extent the courts took the safety of nuclear power plants as a serious matter. I was also unable to feel any confidence or pride in this legal procedure that was meant to be holding those responsible accountable for an unprecedented nuclear accident. 
I believe that the families of the patients at Futama Hospital who died, as well as many other victims of the nuclear power plant accidents who were accusers in this case, were not at all satisfied with the decision e either. Many, many voices of disappointment and anger from the people of Fukushima were published in local newspapers in Fukushima. There were many errors in this decision. For one, the judge's lack of interest in the magnitude and tragedy of the damage caused by the accident. Dozens of testimonies from bereaved families of patients who died, died during the evacuation of Futaba Hospital were shared at the hearing of the first trial and three people also testified through the witness interviews. Let me introduce some of the testimonies that we heard. For example, it is frustrating when things have just been explained away as having been unforeseeable. There are other nuclear power plants on the Pacific coast, so why was it only Fukushima Daiichi that exploded? If they knew it was going, if they knew what was going on and they failed, failed to take countermeasures, wasn't this an, an, an intentional act of negligence? It is frustrating that no one responsible has had to take the proper responsibility. Or if the managers who owe a high duty of care do not take criminal responsibility, there will be no lessons, nothing will be learned for the future. We don't want anyone to feel the same way or go through what we had to go through. Or other testimony said, in the years immediately preceding the accident, there was a series of major disasters. There were questions in the diet about tsunami countermeasures at nuclear power plant. The TEPNO management must have just thought this was someone else's problem. If they had managed their business with a proper sense of urgency and professional prof professionality, the accident would have been avoided. TEPCO itself has become conceited and obsessed with its own safety myth. Another person testified that my father was bedridden and needed someone to reposition him every two hours. He was re receiving nutrition and medication through a central venous catheter, which was removed during the evacuation. This meant that he was unable to take in any water and nutrients for 10 hours before he passed away. My father was cold and I can only imagine how difficult and painful it must have been for him to be unable to move, unable to take in water, unable to take in nutrients. When I examined the body, it looked like a mummy, just bones and skin. Do you, the accused, understand how I felt at that time? In the, during this trial, you've kept saying, it was up to my subordinates. I had no knowledge of what was going on. The cause of my mother's death was acute heart failure, but I believe she was killed by TEPCO. These painful statements were not recognized or utilized at all. There wasn't a single line about how these people had been affected in the high court's decision. The first trial should have shown how difficult it is to do evacuations after a nuclear accident. The judge at the high court was not interested. He showed no, they showed no interest in this. The second mistake in this ruling is that while accepting that the long-term evaluation, which is a tsunami probability prediction that was issued by the National Research Institute for Earthquakes, which is a national agency, while accepting that this should not be overlooked, they accepted the defendant's decision to dismiss the possibility of a tsunami, saying that there was no realistic possibility of a 15.7 meter tsunami hitting the plant. It also exonerated them for not having ordered countermeasures, saying that it was hindsight after the nuclear accident to say that they could have prevented it by making the buildings watertight. A minority opinion of the Supreme Court's decision at the damages trial last June said the following. It is normal that natural phenomenon cannot be predicted and include and have a, an have a certain amount of uncertainty. It's recognized that a tsunami for which countermeasures should be taken is not limited to tsunamis that can be predicted with certainty, but they should be judged rationally from the objective of preventing serious disasters and should be based and take into account the uncertainty of various factors. And we should always uh, prepare conservatively and go to try be on the safe side. 
It means that if we did nothing because we weren't sure, we will cause irreversible accidents, and that is what happened. Finally, the third error was that the court denied the attorney's request for witness examination and on-site inspection of the former head of the earthquake and volcano division of the Japan Meteor Meteorological Agency and the former designer of the Toshiba nuclear power plant. Despite this, the court ruled that the designated attorneys had failed to prove their case. Of course, the attorneys were angry about this. In the TEPCO shareholders lawsuit, Nobuo Hamada, who is a former director of the Earthquake and Volcano Department of the Japan Meteorological Agency, was a witness and testified that he th thought that the long-term evaluation should be respected as a scientific assessment. Atsuo Watanabe, also a former Toshiba nuclear power plant designer, said that even if the probability of a severe accident is low, the fundamental philosophy of nuclear power plants should be to be prepared just in case it could happen and precautions have to be taken. He testified that the flooding countermeasures using technology to make the facilities watertight that exi had existed long before the nuclear accident and that these could have been an effective countermeasure against the accident and that there was enough time to do the construction to put these in place. The high, Tokyo High Court had this testimony but rejected it and I think it's unreasonable to say that this is insufficient proof. We have been fighting for 11 years, filing criminal complaints, all because we earnestly hope that the truth will be revealed and that those responsible for the nuclear accident will be held accountable so that a similar tragedy will never happen again. Now that the Kishida administration has decided to promote nuclear power again, if those who should take responsibility for causing nuclear accidents are not properly judged, it will surely lead to another nuclear accident. I strongly believe that such a this is that such a legal ruling is not good enough and that society should not allow this to happen. We filed an appeal on January 24th. I am aware that it's going to be difficult to overturn the conviction at the Supreme Court, but we mustn't give up. We have all the evidence we need to hold them accountable. The lawyers say that if the judge is rational and a fair-minded person, a conviction can be achieved. We must now raise awareness in society about the errors made in the court decisions so far. We want to make the future that we hand our, over to our children as good and as hopeful as it can be, please, please support us. I would also like to talk about another issue. This is about the Alps treated contaminated water that is going to be discharged into the Pacific Ocean this spring or summer. This contaminated water is planned to be discharged into the ocean through a one kilometer tunnel that's dug from the TEPCO site along the sea floor. Once it starts flowing, the contaminated water that is in the tanks on the plant now will flow out into the ocean for more than 30 years. Even now, 140 tons of groundwater per day is flowing into the reactor buildings and becoming contaminated with radiation. If this flow of groundwater is not stopped, it will continue to flow in for an even longer period of time. The water flowing into the reactor contains 860 trillion becquerels of tri tritium, as well as other radioactive materials from the meltdown. Some of these materials exceed safety standards, but it's not clear whether they will be removed by the secondary treatment. And because there are no regulations on the total amount of water that can be discharged, no matter how diluted it is, eventually all of this radiation is going to be discharged into the ocean. Several alternatives to ocean discharge have been proposed by the public and civil society. These include transferring the waste to large robust tanks that have already been proven to work and storing the waste on land. However, neither the government nor TEPCO is willing to even discuss these alternatives.
There's also a proposal to build a large scale underground water barrier to, to stop the generation of ground water. This has also been proven to be a valid uh, option, but TEPCO has not adopted it. What the government and TEPCO have done to stop the underground water from flowing is to build a frozen soil wall. The government and TEPCO decided to invest 34.5 billion yen of taxpayers' money into this plan because the government's research and development funds could be used for it and TEPCO would not have to bear any costs. However, the frozen soil wall is incomplete and cannot stop groundwater and it's only said to be to last for seven years and its expiration date is approaching. In addition, the cost of the electricity required to freeze the soil is 1 billion yen per year. On April 13, 2021, the Japanese government ignored the voices of fishermen and local government councils, many residents and the public, and decided to discharge the water into the ocean at a meeting of government ministers without any deliberation by the Diet. There was no consultation with countries connect on the other side of the ocean, and they didn't listen to the concerns and protests from other countries at all. In 2015, Meti and Tepco made a written promise to the Fukushima Prefectural Fisheries Federation that no such disposal would take place without the understanding of concerned parties. We've asked Tepco and Meti in various forms, what would you consider, no what, what do you mean when you, uh, this understanding needs to be reached? And who are the parties concerned? And we've asked them, to fulfill, to, to, to explain it to us so that we can understand. But every time they just repeat to us, we will persist in our efforts to gain your understanding. But I don't know what they mean by understanding. Before the release, both Mehdi and Tucko have Conducted proportional tours and given school lectures, but they've been fraudulent in their explanations to reassure people by using a device that can only measure gamma rays against a bottle containing tritium, which emits beta rays, and so showing and they showed that the needle didn't move. Uh, we have repeatedly asked TEPCO and Medi to stop this kind of practice that takes advantage of people, but they have no showed no signs of stopping. Uh, Medi has established a 30 billion yen and a further 50 billion yen fund for the fishery industry to counter reputational damage. This is, it's, it's said that it would be used to support efforts to expand sales channels for marine products and the provision of marine products to company cafeterias and online sales of marine products. Uh, but there is a PR initiative also included in this budget. Budget at the end of last year, Medi spent 1.2 billion yen on a project with. Dentsu, a major advertising agency, and they ran a nationwide PR campaign called Activities to Foster Public Understanding of Alps Treated Water. This included TV programs, commercials, newspaper ads, web ads, outdoor ads, and ads on public transportation. The catch copy for this PR stunt was, let's learn together, let's think about Alps Treated Water, and to promote reconstruction, to prevent rumors from spreading. They also produced pamphlets and videos and symposiums and seminars were also held. And aside from that, there was also various media content or projects to disseminate information to dispel rumors. And this project had a budget of 380 million yen. There were two public relations projects that Hakuhodo, another advertising company was commissioned to undertake. One project was to provide marine products from Fukushima and neighboring prefectures as ingredients for school lunches at elementary and middle schools. Another project is said to provide high school students with on-site lectures in and outside of Fukushima to further their understanding. It says the project includes planning and organizing of events, etc., for high school students across Japan. These classes are conducted by visiting counselors, policy researchers, and supervisors from the Reconstruction Agency. Here are some comments from high school students who 
uh, participated in such classes. I thought that the discharge of treated water into the ocean would affect the human body. I learned for the first time that it is safe. I have learned that Alps treated water is scientifically safe, but I would like to learn how to resolve the psychological anxiety that it comes with it. The talk of harmful rumors left an impression on me. I would like to deepen my understanding so that I don't have prejudice due to lack of information. I would like to convey accurate information about radiation, which is often perceived as a very scary thing. I thought it would be good to start new businesses that would bring money into Fukushima and help with recovery. And some other opinions as well. Uh, I believe that a large amount of taxpayer money is being spent to unilaterally communicate what the government thinks and make young people part of a PR stunt. From the beginning, the disposal of contaminated water has been promoted under the claim that it is essential for the smooth realization of decommissioning power plants. Although the decommissioning of reactors is supposed to be for the reconstruction of Fukushima and for the victims of Fukushima, I do not believe that it is in the best interest of these victims. During this period, we have taken various actions to stop the discharge of contaminated water into the ocean. We've, these include negotiations with TEPCO, town meetings in various parts of the prefecture, petitions and appeals to the Fukushima prefectural governor, prefectural assembly, and local governments, and demonstrations and protests. We have also, sold several, we have also held several meetings with TEPCO and METI to exchange opinions. We've also connected with people from the Pacific Rim and held international forums online. At the Pacific Islands Forum, it was stated that for coastal Pacific Islanders, the ocean is still an essential means of our livelihood and discharging contaminated water into the ocean is a violation of our human rights. The people of the forum were angered by Japanese government's insincerity and they visited Japan to meet with Prime Minister Kishida. The National Ocean Oceanographic Institutes Association, an association of 100 oceanographic institutes in the US, has also issued a statement opposing the discharge of contaminated water into the ocean. We hope that citizens around the world will come together to stop the environmental pollution caused by the intentional discharge of contaminated water into the ocean as well as the violation of human rights of the people living off of the ocean and of marine life. We are now planning to call on people around the world to take action on April 13th this year as the Global Day of Action since April 13th, 2021 was the date when the Japanese government decided to release contaminated water into the ocean. Another activity we are now promoting is to send postcards to the governor of Fukushima Prefecture and the mayors of Okuma and Futaba, where the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant is located, um, asking them to not just charge the water into the ocean. We call this action stakeholders' voices to appeal that we as well, not only just the fishermen, are stakeholders in this issue. Currently, it's estimated that 1,400 postcards have been sent to Fukushima Prefectural Government and 1,500 to Futaba Town. This campaign is also being conducted in the US as well, and I encourage all of you to participate if possible. Aside from the contaminated water and lawsuits, many other problems are piling up, including the cutoff of support for evacuees, the reuse of contaminated soil correct collected during decontamination, health hazards such as thyroid cancer, the increasing number of disaster-related deaths, the gap between the huge reconstruction budget spent and the reconstruction that the victims actually want, and the spread of special demand that uses the nuclear disaster to gain profit in the affected areas. And it has only been 12 years from the Fukushima disaster, but the government has been foolish enough to let go of the path it chose in reflection of the disaster, which was to reduce dependence on nuclear power and to set the operating period of nuclear power plants to 40 years and separate the promotion and regulation of nuclear power plants and to make decisions where even we, the victims of this nuclear disaster, have no involvement, our sacrifices going ignored. We must ask ourselves how we can stop this policy that is being decided on without us.
During these times, I always want to return to the principle that nuclear power is the same technology as the atomic bomb and that it cannot exist without sacrificing lives and that there is no threshold for the health effects of radiation and it cannot coexist with life. Thank you very much for listening today. Atoriko, thank you very much for sharing. As mentioned in her speech, uh, there has been a lot that has been done in the past 12 years, but despite that, the current administration is going backwards in terms of policy. And so they are really disregarding all of the, that, the things that the victims have gone through and that activists have fought for. Thank you very much, Mito-san, for sharing. Next, we will be hearing about the 311 children's thyroid cancer lawsuit uh, from attorney Miho Kumazawa. Ms. Kumazawa is a member of the 311 children's thyroid cancer lawsuit and the deputy secretary general of the Fukushima Network of Lawyers for Children. Uh, over to you, Ms. Kumazawa. Hello, everybody. My name is Miho Kumazawa. I am a member of the 311 Child Thyroid Cancer Lawsuit Lawyers Association. This is a picture from when we filed the suit. It's now the fifth trial in this case. Today I will be talking about the point of view and the, the um, sharing the voices of the accusers in this case, as well as my own personal feelings on this case. Next slide, please. So first of all, this is an overview of the lawsuit. We uh, submitted the suit in on the 27th of January 2022. I won't go into all the details here, but the uh, defendant or accused is Tokyo Electricity Company, TEPCO. We discussed who should be the defendant a lot. We had lots of discussions about this, but we wanted to prioritize making the court case as quick as short as possible. So we excluded the Japanese state or Fukushima prefecture from the defendant. We want to get compensation as soon as possible for the children who are currently suffering the effects. Uh, we wanted to avoid it becoming a long drawn out court case. This is why we excluded the Japanese state and Fukushima prefecture from the defendant. So what I want to talk about is why we only started this legal case 10 years after the accident. On the slide, it says we have six accusers. We now actually have seven. I'd also like to talk about why there's only six or seven people, why this number of is low. So first of all, I'd like you to hear directly from the accusers in this case. This is about three minutes of video taken from the testimony in the case. <laughs> I have joined this class action suit against TEPCO. We have filed our suit. I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer and I was told that it does not have any causal relationship to the nuclear power accident. I still can't forget how this made me feel at the time.
before I was diagnosed with cancer. I wanted to go to Tokyo and I wanted to become a, have a strong career. But after I was diagnosed with cancer and I had the operation, I was unwell and I was forced to always put my health first. And I managed to get the job that I wanted, but I had to leave that job. And now I'm doing a more a job that is less burden on my house many of my friends have had to other people other children who've been diagnosed with cancer have not been able to get the jobs that they want have been suffering due to the consequences of ill health and we know that there was discrimination against the people who evacuated after the nuclear power accident. And because of this, we have been afraid that we will also face discrimination. And this has made it difficult for us to talk about our cancer. I've felt afraid in the past 10 years, I've been so afraid and not been able to tell anyone. There are about 300 children in the same situation as us now. I, we want to help these children. If the six of us raising our voices can help all the many children who are suffering from thyroid cancer, then that's why we are raising our voices. And I sincerely hope that I can, we can improve the situation. And finally, I'd like to say that the support of the people around us is so important to us. I'd like to say thank you from the bottom of my, of my heart to the people who are supporting us and the lawyers. Thank you. Let's go to the next slide. So this was a video from when the we made the lawsuit. As you heard, she was saying she was unable to tell anybody about it for 10 years. As she mentioned, more than 600 children have been diagnosed with thyroid cancer and more than 200 of those have had either one or both of their thyroid glands removed. So normally, you would think in this kind of situation, you could have a class lawsuit with a hundred or more people. But what has actually happened is that the patients, the people who have, the children who have cancer, find feel that they can't tell anyone about their cancer. They're divided, they're isolated. There's 300 people that are all facing the same situation, but they don't know each other. They haven't been able to tell each other about what they've been facing. They've been only been able to tell their close family about their cancer. And the reason these children feel like they're unable to tell anyone about what they're going through is because they're afraid of being criticized or um, discriminated against. And they're afraid of this. And we often hear that this is the case. that many of the accusers talk about how they haven't been able to tell even their friends about their cancer. They would say things like, what if people uh, suddenly become really concerned and treat me differently? So these children haven't even told their close friends at school that they've been diagnosed with cancer. However, if we don't really face this problem, these children feel that they can't move forward. So they 
have decided that if they can win this court case and the relationship between the connection between the nuclear power plant and the cancer can be established then this can help them move forward and it can also make it clear that having thyroid cancer is not something that you need to hide and it's something that you can raise your voice about and this is the mo what has motivated these people to come forward in this lawsuit and also they feel that it's important that they don't want to hurt people who are looking out for Fukushima Prefecture. So when sometimes they are criticized and said, are you trying to slander Fukushima Prefecture? But And they say that even if they don't actually say things against Fukushima, there's a kind of feeling that they're criticizing their homeland. And so these are all things that have influenced the fact that it's taken 10 years for people to come forward. And also, despite the huge number of children who are affected by the cancer, there only being six or seven who have been able to come forward. This is information about the accusers in the case uh, originally there were six now as i mentioned earlier we have seven the age at the time of filing the suit the youngest was six the oldest was 16 it, you, they are much they're older now because it's been 10 years some of them remember the nuclear accident some of them are too young to remember the nuclear accident they are all still young but have cancer On the next slide, I'd like to talk about accusers five and six. I, I'm not using their names, um, and I'd like to share their voices. Number five has testified that recently I relapsed and I was told that I would need to have my third operation at first, I, I, of course, I don't want to do the operation, but more than that, I feel bad about causing trouble for my mother. I have, I feel anxious. I can't think about the future. I'm really worried about now and the future. But at the same time, I've, I'm glad it's me that's sick, not my family or friends. Even to the to the judges in this case, I would, I'm glad that it's not their children who have thyroid cancer. This is her testimony. I haven't, I might have changed the order, but I haven't changed the words. And she said, is it okay to, to say the word yabai, which is quite a casual Japanese word a very colloquial word um, and I said yes you know use your own words because they they have important meaning and also what she's saying when she says to the judges I'm glad it's not your children that have thyroid cancer and even when I think about this now it brings tear to my eyes tears to my eyes and she really really feels this way she's doesn't wish this on anyone else it was so difficult for her it's still difficult for her and as she testified she feels anxiety about the future what is she worried about she doesn't know exactly or precisely it's just a general fear and anxiety towards the future she says that she can't think about the future so it's a very very difficult situation for her but she feels if it's her she can deal with it she can put up with it but she wouldn't wish it on anyone and she feels that it would be even harder if her if it was her friends or family who had cancer she thinks about her friends that they'd go to the corners corner store together before the 
the nuclear accident, they'd hang out together. And after the nuclear accident, they would also hang out together on the streets and in areas with high levels of radiation. And when she thinks that possibly her friends could also develop thyroid cancer, she feels that it's she'd rather it's herself. And this is her testimony now, but we have to try, and it's very difficult for us to even imagine what she's gone through for 10 years in order to feel this way. But we also must think about the responsibility to change society when society has forced a young girl at this age to have to go through this and give this testimony. Next, I would like to go to number seven. She joined the lawsuit later on. After I was diagnosed with cancer, I can't remember what I was thinking about on the train. My mind was blank. I even thought my family was my enemy, and I thought even my family would be um, talking about me behind my back. I had to think about getting a job, but both physically and psychologically, I had no energy left. I, used to, I, I just stayed at home. I didn't want to talk to anybody. But when I started to get over these feelings, I started to question what I'm doing, and I was really um, angry with myself as well. And when I heard about the case, the, the lawsuit, I felt like I should stand up and take action. It was something that happened in the past, but what's important is how we can connect it to the future. So number seven, they didn't know about the lawsuit originally, but they heard about the lawsuit later and decided to join us and she said she wanted to also be one of the accusers in the in the in the lawsuit at the bottom of this page you can see her testimony They said they felt it was their own fault that they had got cancer. The thinking, it's not about what they, it wasn't that she thought that she did something wrong, or they thought that they did something wrong that gave them cancer. It was more that it was on her own head that she had to be responsible for her own cancer. But when they heard about the lawsuit, it gave her hope and she realized when they realized that the cause of the cancer might not be might be elsewhere and they decided if they didn't join the lawsuit and they didn't properly face the reasons for them getting cancer they would not be able to move forward And unfortunately, they have faced um, criticism on SNS, on the internet and social media. For example, some comments might say, that's something from the past, you should just put it behind you and move forward. Um, and she's responding to that in this testimony. The comment on social media was telling her to forget about the past and move forward, but they feel that we mustn't forget the past, and if we don't properly face it, we cannot move forward. So that's what they feel. In her testimony, she also said, even my family appeared to be an enemy to me. You think about the age of these young people, they're thinking about their future, what jobs they're going to get, their careers, 
it's a time of life when they're really thinking about the future, but they get diagnosed with cancer. And this is something not just for number seven, it was relevant to many of the members, like the person you just heard from who was also talking about her career. These young people are forced to think that it might not be realistic to pursue their dreams or they're just so overwhelmed by the treatment and the operations that they aren't even able to think about the future. And it means that they can no longer trust anybody. They take it out on their family and then they don't like themselves for taking it out on their family. And it's a vicious cycle that they face. Next slide, please. Number seven, this is the second part of uh, her testimony. In the, at the trial, she used the name of the judges. She called them by name. Sakamoto-san, Noguchi-san. Saying, um, she said to the, the judges, we are anonymous in this case but do you know we we each have a name do you know our names i used to think this was someone else's problem but now it's my problem but i know how you might feel you think it's someone else's problem but i want you to understand why we have to stand up And of course, the judges themselves do know the names of each of the accusers. But this has to, because they're, they're very supportive of the need to have the accusers to protect their anonymity. For example, they're called by numbers rather than their names or they're hidden behind screens. But in response to this, she made the judges look at her as a person by using their names and reminding them that each accuser is not just a number, is a person with a name. And I hope this really got the message across to the judges. Uh, this particular accuser found out about her cancer much later on. And so until that point, she had, hadn't had been very uh, aware of the issues of radiation and cancer. That was due to the fact that they, they were much younger and Because she had been in a, apathetic to that issue, she blamed herself. And she hadn't thought of it as her problem. She, she thought it was somebody else's problem until that point. And so she understood that the judges might feel that way because she had done so in the past. But she wanted them to understand that how difficult it is to share her cancer diagnosis and how much bravery is needed in order for her to share that. And so she spoke about how she wanted the judges to understand. So as I've shared up until now, each accuser has their own um, experiences and, and feelings and thoughts. And I won't be, I didn't share about each person's background, but by being diagnosed with cancer, uh, they each have been fighting to be compensated for that, but the main thing that they seek is to take back their dignity as human beings to try to live their lives to the fullest. It's not just a simple matter of getting compensation for their medical bills. They do need to continue taking 
medication and there are lots of fees that incur as a result, but that that's not the main issue. Throughout their young lives, it's their their youth is such an important time where they're deciding so many things about their life. And at that point they each had a cancer diagnosis which would which halted so many of those decisions or changed those decisions such as having children or choosing a career. And so it this lawsuit was a way for them to take back their lives and to take back control. Please move on to the next slide. And so the significance of this trial, I would like to share uh, the accuser's words. Our children who are even younger than me have thyroid cancer and are suffering from it. So for the sake of these children, I want to make sure that we who have grown up before them can go to court and win this case to make sure that they can get all the support that they need. And uh, our thoughts as the legal team, we wanted to uh, support these children so that they could move forward. And that was very important, but also in the background it, behind those seven children, there were 300 other children who were affected. And we wanted to create a support system for these children so that they can live with peace of mind for the rest of their lives. That's one of our our goals or what we would like to make a reality. As these children continue on with their lives, they do need support for medication and financial aid for all of the medical bills. But through this trial, we hope to change society, the society in which they felt that they had to hide their diagnosis. Number seven uh, shared testimony recently without the screen hiding her appearance. And uh, she kept her name anonymous, of course, but that was still something that needed so much courage because they had not yet shared that with their friends. But at court, even just speaking in court is very intimidating and uh, us lawyers are used to doing that, but going to a courtroom itself is scary and speaking there is very daunting, but they, number seven, decided that they could do it without the, the screen, which wasn't necessary for them to do, but I think that that was very brave. And they sat in their seat in the courtroom without um, being hidden as well. And that was a huge step, I think. And also, I just remembered about number five, who spoke with her very um, real words. During her uh, testimony, they thought that someone would represent all the youth and speak, but they wanted to each share their uh, experiences and because they all have different experiences and different uh, things happening. And so no, they decided that they would each speak up. But when it was decided that everyone would speak, uh, they were quite concerned when they heard that they're not Number five wasn't great at speaking in front of people or writing words. And so after they did it, they were very glad to have done so. And everyone, including the lawyers and all of the people who were listening were in tears. And we weren't even, uh, number five wasn't even sure why she, they were crying, but uh, number five wasn't crying. We were crying for throughout the case, but uh, number seven is a very bright and energetic young person who normally isn't very emotional in our previous interactions, but at court that day, she they had also cried. So being diagnosed with cancer they spoke about that experience um, 
without getting too emotional, but at the trial, they were crying as they shared that experience. Usually they can speak about that without it being too emotional, but obviously they remembered all the, the suffering that they went through and they had accepted that they had to have surgery because the doctor told them, but I, I saw that, that had, it wasn't that simple and they had gone through so much. And so as a legal team that was fighting alongside these children, we saw everything that they had been through psychologically, physically, and we wanted to accept all of that and to help shoulder some of the burden that these children were bearing. Next slide, please. So um, this is, as we continue, these trials, um, your support is very important to us. Uh, we are doing crowdfunding and also accepting donations. And aside from that, I think just this, the support in general that we are receiving is really um, giving strength to all of these young people. Uh, a lot of people have been showing up to with our, these proceedings and sometimes there's so many people that not everyone is able to enter the room, but we really feel the support and that is helping to push forward our efforts. And since since the beginning of this trial, I think the, the faces of all of the children and it has changed and they've really um, been feeling all the support. Um, so for the upcoming schedule, I would like to share that. On March 15th from 2 p.m. Japan time, there will be the fifth oral proceedings. That'll be the last um, testimony sharing. Uh, we wanted to do one per person, but uh, last time and the next session, two people will be speaking. And so the last two people uh, will be speaking at this one. So uh, if you're able to show up and uh, support them, that would be wonderful. The sixth and seventh oral proceeding dates have also been decided. So if you're able to join us for those, that would be greatly appreciated as well. So that is all for my part, but uh, these children and our legal team will continue to fight. And we hope that obviously uh, we regret that they had to be diagnosed with cancer, but moving forward, uh, we hope that we can support them as they uh, move on from this diagnosis and live lives that they're that are happy and fruitful. And so uh, we appreciate any support you can give us in this endeavor. Uh, that is all for my part. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ms. Mazawa. I was really moved by all of the testimony from the young people that you shared with us. Thank you very much. Before we move to part two, we'd like to have a moment's silence. Ms. Muto. Okay, everybody. So let's have a moment's silence together. We look at the world now, there is war, conflicts, natural disasters. Many people are affected by these tragedies. The people, the victims of the March 11th earthquake and disaster, 
and all the people around the world who are victims of war, conflict, and natural disasters around the world now, and with a prayer for peace in the future, let's all stand up and have a moment's silence to remember these victims and to pray for peace. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mador and everybody. Now we will move on to part two of today's event about nuclear power and energy policy. Last month, the Japanese government announced a cabinet decision on the GX or Green Transformation Strategy policy. They're saying they're going to continue to discuss this policy, but in reality, the content of it is not green at all, and it is actually just promoting nuclear power. While there are many people who are calling for nuclear power to be used as a solution for climate change, the reality is that nuclear power is not a solution for climate change at all, and this is clear if you read the details of the GX policy. In the second part of today's event, we will start off by hearing from Leona Morgan, who is working to abolish nuclear power in America. She will be talking about how nuclear power isn't a solution to climate change. Leona is an activist and community organizer who has been fighting nuclear colonialism since 2007. In 2014, she co-founded Dainé No Nukes, a vehicle for Dainé and indigenous-driven work. Simultaneous interpretation will be provided for Leona's talk, who is joining us via Zoom today. Please select Japanese on Zoom if you'd like to listen in Japanese. Japanese interpretation will be broadcast in the venue. So, Leona, over to you. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I'm, I'm so happy to be a part of your event. Uh, thank you to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, right now, um, it's almost 8 o'clock um, in the United States on Friday evening. I'm just going to speak a little bit in my language, and then I'll start with my presentation. Um, um, so I just introduced myself by my clans as indigenous people. Um, many of us have traditional ways that we relate to each other, um, traditional systems of how we relate to Mother Earth. And as a Diné person, um, I I'm not, I just will explain quickly. Uh, I want to talk a lot about being indigenous and 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 you know fighting colonization and United States imperialism and all of the racism and white supremacy and and these things that we're fighting um, because of the exploitation of our land, the the theft of our land, the genocide. I don't have time to go into that history, but I think it's important that people know. It is still happening today in a different way. And so um, I call this nuclear colonialism. Some people call it radioactive colonialism. And so the things I'm gonna talk about today, um, it, it's the same story that you all have heard, um, the same story of contamination, trying to hold the government and companies accountable, you know, with them not listening and and we've been working my people have been working for for many decades in the united states there are some successes um you know like the radiation exposure compensation act rica i know this is something um your folks might be working toward uh i, I don't have time to talk about everything i'm going to focus on two things today which is uranium mining and nuclear waste and um 
So the first thing I want to say um, that uh, I, if I can share my screen, I have a, a map of um, just just to show you some of the places uh, where I'm coming from. Um, so I'm going to quickly share my screen. It's just a Google map, but I'm going to start with uh, a place called Shinkalobwe. So I don't know how many of you um, have heard of Shinkalobwe. This is a place in the Democratic Republic of the Congo in Africa. And this is where the first uranium came from that was then processed in the United States under the Manhattan Project and then used on your people during World, World War II in 1945. And so the uranium came from here and the community people, they, they mined it with their bare hands. We hear many, many stories of worker, worker problems, um, the lack of information, the lack of you know, uh, protection, um, healthcare, and then later compensation. And many people have died from mining uranium, transporting uranium, processing uranium. And so we hear the same lies that th this is the old uranium. The new, the new mining is different and it's cleaner. This is, you know, these are some of the, the industry's propaganda today. So this is the first uh, uranium used in, in nuclear weapons. And, and so I wanted to highlight that because we have relatives um, in Africa fighting not just the uranium mining, but today there's other fights of extractive industries like lithium and cobalt um, because of the push for renewables. So there's many extractive fights in the world and it's mostly people of color that live near these sites. And we're dealing with um, contamination to our water, contamination to our land, our animals, our food, our, our medicine, our sacred places, the places where we pray, um, contamination to newborn babies. So all of these things happen all over the world. Today, I'm gonna focus on my story. Um, again, I'm Dine, And so we have a lot of history with uranium mining. Um, and a lot of this is in New Mexico. And so I am from, the Navajo Nation, which is the government. So this is the government of my people. It's the colonized government. So in the United States, um, we have the largest, uh, what they call a reservation. So my people, I'd like to say, yes, we are sovereign. We have laws. You know, we are a nation. As indigenous peoples, we have a language, a culture, a history, and we've been here for thousands of years. Yet we are not 100% sovereign because we're still under the federal government. And as indigenous peoples, we have many layers of uh, jurisdiction. And at different levels, um, we have the, the indigenous nations, they call it the tribal level. So there's over 570 indigenous nations in, our, in, in the United States, more in Canada, Mexico, and South America. But in the United States, about 575 that are recognized by the United States. So we have various governments, each of our people that, you know, we have a government that interacts with the state and the federal. My people, we interact with the state of Arizona and the state of New Mexico and, and the state of Utah. And the reason I bring this up is because it's incredibly, it's incredibly difficult when you're fighting nuclear because there's different laws, there's different regulations, there's different funding. And that funding, the money determines cleanup and you know these these different things that that we're working toward. And and my my mouse, it just landed on Monument Valley, one of the most beautiful places I I think you know on our in our sacred four sacred mountains. This is a place where there was uh, uranium mining, so there is contamination at this place, uh, Monument Valley. But I'm going to zoom in. Uh, several of these dots, they're my personal markers for nuclear sites in New Mexico, but I'm going to focus on um, two sites. So right here, this is uh, one site I'll come to in a minute. Whole Tech is the name of the company we're fighting there. I have a house on the Navajo, a little bit off the Navajo Nation in the checkerboard area. Um, I'm saying a lot of words that I don't know if you will understand, but the checkerboard is also it talks about the it's about the the jurisdiction so um my house I have out there that's that picture is not the right picture 
but I'm going to talk about church rock. So today I'm going to focus on the front end of the nuclear fuel chain. And so um, this area is, is the northwestern part of the state of New Mexico. So you can see the state of New Mexico here. Um, so the, a lot of the uranium mining happened up here. So I'm going to talk about this part here. And then I'm also going to talk about the southeast. But there's a lot more to it. I'm going to put some links in the chat. Um, for now, I'll just give a quick talk about nuclear energy. So to, to give a basic understanding of um, nuclear energy um, in the global context, um, I, I did attend recently the United Nations, uh, they call it the COP or the Convening of Parties, which is a meeting, which is part of the United Nations framework on the Convention of Climate Change. Um, it's a UN meeting, it was in Egypt, and this is where the world governments come together to, to try to figure out what to do about climate change. And this year, last year was the 27th meeting. So for 27 years, the world's powers have been coming together to figure this out. This past meeting, it had a lot of influence from the nuclear industry and fossil fuels. So internationally, the push for nuclear is very, very strong. So the International Atomic Energy Agency once had the slogan, atoms for peace. And right now they're saying atoms for climate. And we say this is a false solution. The reason it is a false solution is because they, they consider nuclear energy as carbon free or carbon zero, net carbon. They make up all these words um, They you know to greenwash it or to, I, I just say they're lies and, and propaganda. Nuclear energy is not carbon zero. Nuclear energy is not carbon free. Nuclear energy, I say nuclear energy is nuclear weapons. Nuclear energy is death and destruction to my people and people all over the world dealing with the impacts from the nuclear industry. We know they're there, we live it. We've had our own family members die of different cancers. My family has, a lot of my family um, has been impacted, I know, and hurt by the uranium industry. Of course, we can't prove it. Um, this was a long time ago, and after people die, a lot of times you can't prove it. But we know that our people have been hurt by this industry, whether they say they are or not, and whether they pay for it or not. And so we've done a lot of work in the United States to, to try to get toward cleanup. Um, but the reality is the front end of the nuclear fuel chain is very dirty. And the front end of the nuclear fuel chain cannot exist without fossil fuels. And so I live in a place where it has been mined for uranium and the uranium, they take it out of the ground and they have to process it using, well, in, in the area where I live, we have no nuclear power plants. So all of it is going, is, is, is fueled by fossil fuels. And so in the, in my part of the country that has been mined by uranium, um, we estimate there's about 500 abandoned uranium mines in the state of New Mexico and some, and the government, the United States government is working with the Navajo Nation to clean up abandoned uranium mines on Navajo Nation. So they estimate there's about 523 abandoned uranium mines on the Navajo Nation. Diné people, so my people, the community who live at these places, they say it's more like 2,000. And across the country, there's over 15,000. And so all of that uranium that was mined, it was done using fossil fuels. And today, okay, so I need to explain, when the mining started, the United States EPA didn't exist. So the mining was happening in the, maybe the late 40s, you know, we know definitely happening in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. The EPA and laws to protect the environment did not exist until the 70s. So all of that mining before, there were no regulations to clean it up. So right now, all of those mines are still out there. And today, there is still no law to clean them up. Maybe, maybe there is some uh, cleanup in some places. Um, but these are the old mines before there was laws to clean them up. And on the Navajo Nation, they're working toward this. And the way they're doing it is containing the radiation, the contamination at the site. So essentially, we will end up with 523 to 2,000 permanent radioactive waste sites. In some places, like in Church Rock, 
This is where the world had the largest release of uranium. There was an accident on July 16, 1979. So in Church Rock, this is again in the northeastern part of the state, there was a uranium mine. Um, and, and I'm just going to tell a quick story because I don't have time to talk about the whole thing, but there's a, Nap a Diné community right now who lives there who is still fighting this issue and could use support. So the community, Redwater Pond Road, they live within the, the area they live in. There's three abandoned uranium mines and one uranium mill. So the mine that was using the mill to process the uranium today is owned by General Electric. And right now they're planning a cleanup. And so, you know, this is way 40 years, almost 50 years later, they're, they're talking about cleaning up the mine by picking up the waste and putting it on top of the mill waste where the spill happened. I know this might be kind of complicated to understand, but when you have the front end of the uranium, the nuclear fuel cycle or the fuel chain, we call it, we don't call it a cycle. I also like to call it the uranium fuel chain because uranium as a fuel, it is for both nuclear energy and nuclear weapons. So when we're talking about the uranium fuel chain, all of that, it requires not just the mine, but the mill, unless you're doing in, in situ leach mining, which is different, but all of this must be transported. So they will transport the uranium all over the world in the United States and in New Mexico, we do have an enrichment facility owned by Urenco and that's a different story. So there's several stages of the fuel chain. Uranium processing in order to produce the fuel, it, it takes several steps before it gets to the nuclear power plant. And so when they say anything about nuclear being some kind of solution, it's because the, the agency, um, the International Atomic Energy Agency and the different governments that are looking at the carbon output of nuclear energy, they only count the carbon emissions from the power plant. So they don't count the uranium mining or the processing or the transportation, the fuel fabrication. And this is why nuclear is not a solution because you need fossil fuels in order to make uranium fuel for the power plant. Now, after the power plant, so the carbon footprint is the construction, the operation and the decontamination of just the power plant. And so after the power plant, you have high level radioactive waste. Now, right now in the country, there's nowhere to put it. And so in New Mexico, a company named Holtec is proposing to build a storage facility, a temporary storage that will hold all of the waste from all of the power plants until the United States finds a scientifically viable solution of what to do with this waste. So if we have no solution, um, we need to stop making this waste. The industry, the agencies that calculate the carbon footprint of nuclear, they do not count the carbon footprint of the waste. So in the United States, we are fighting this company, Holtec. Um, there's a second proposal to, to also store the waste in Texas. The state of Texas is also fighting the United States. And they took them to court. Texas took the United States to court. They lost, and so now they are appealing. In New Mexico, the United States Nuclear Regulatory Commission will be giving the license to Holtec at the end of the month. So the, the United States government is the agent, is the entity, is is the is the what they they call themselves, I guess they would consider themselves the the supreme law of the land. So they are giving the license to Holtec. New Mexico as a state is a smaller government and we're trying to fight the federal government. And so we're doing that through uh, legislation right now in our state, the lawmakers are gathering in Santa Fe. And so I'm working on one bill specifically, it's uh, Senate Bill 53. And so this is something that our people have been working on for years this year. So this is a new law 
that we're trying to get passed in New Mexico. And so I know it's very specific to our state, but this is this is what we're doing um, to combat this global push for nuclear. And and I just want to to finish my talk by by saying there's there's a lot more um, nuclear projects that we we hear the government talking about. And so we have community people in New Mexico, all over the country. Um, I'm part of international coalitions as well. So there's community people all over the world, like you who are watching your governments. And, and we're all fighting these things at, at different levels in different places. And what we're hearing, the new stuff or the things, they're calling it new, but it's it's the old stuff with with maybe a new name or a new package, and and this is small modular nuclear reactors. This is um, nuclear hydrogen, um, and things like that. So I just I just wanted to share. Um, I, I didn't talk a lot about Navajo Nation, but we do have a law against uranium mining, and we do have a law against transport. So I, I, I talked a little bit about the local issue in Church Rock with the Diné people. I talked a little bit about the state level. Um, I didn't talk about the United States, but I think on that level, um, I just want to say in Japan, I think I think we see it in, in, in Germany as well. Their government had decided to stop nuclear, but people like... Um, uh, I'm going to say Greta Thunberg and, and others who are misinformed about nuclear pushed um, to have Germany restart. And, and this was this was a huge setback for us because Germany would have led the, the way in the world to stop nuclear. So if Japan, I know it is a difficult fight, but this is something we must all work together to, to stop new nuclear, to stop any restart, to stop life extension to clean up contamination, to prevent new nuclear. And, and this is only possible by talking to each other and educating one another and supporting one another. One another. And so I will just say thank you. I know there's a, a lot more to talk about and I am so happy to, to, to be with you all. And um, thank you to the work, um, please keep fighting. And I, I hope uh, I was in Japan 10 years ago in 2013. And um, for me, it was sad that it was only men doing the work, but today I see all the women speaking and, and facilitating, and I am so happy. It makes me happy to see the women being recognized. And, and, and I wanna thank you for your work. Thank you, Leona. Thank you very much. We heard about from Leona, who's working in New Mexico on working with the indigenous people. And she talked about the waste and also the pollution. We have some comments about Leona's talk how the government might pretend that it's new, but it's not really new at all. That's exactly the same as what's happening in Japan with GX. We mustn't be fooled by this and we must stop this movement back to um, nuclear power. Thank you very much, Leona, for your powerful message. Next, we'd like to move on to Michita from FOE, who will be talking about Kishida administration's GX policy moving, shifting back towards nuclear power. Okay, over to you, Michita san Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for participating today. My name is Mitsuda from FOE Japan. 
Today, I would like to speak about the promotion, uh, stopping the promotion of GX and nuclear power in Japan and what we can do. As many of you may already know, there is a lot of promotion being done for nuclear power uh, and GX, which is a green transformation policy. It's very unclear what is being transformed into green, but uh, we it is something that would keep the current state of uh, using and producing and consuming a lot of energy in place. In, on February 10th, the cabinet approved of the GX basic policy and GX promotion law. And on February 28th, the cabinet approved of a bundle of bills for nuclear power plant promotion. This bundle of bills uh, was uh, a number of related bills that were discussed at once, or will be discussed at once at the diet. And so this, the fact that they are being discussed as a group is an issue. The government would like to avoid long discussions. And so their thought is that to bundle those up to discuss at once at the diet. So this bundle of bills is called the GX decarbonization power supply bill but it's not as though they are trying to create a law of that same name. Um, this includes the Atomic Energy Basic Law or the Act on the Regulation of Nuclear Reactors. Or they are trying to amend some of these pre-existing laws so that they can promote the use of nuclear power. And so specifically, there are these five laws that are involved. First is the Atomic Energy Basic Law. It is considered the constitution of nuclear power, so to speak. Uh, it regulates the fundamental principles of nuclear energy use, the safety, um, and a lot of the basic aspects of it. However, the country is trying to use nuclear power as and development of technology and training new people. They're trying to use taxes, taxpayers' money to promote uh, nuclear power and provide a basis for that. Uh, they're also trying to change the Electricity Business Act as well as the Act on the Regulation of Nuclear Reactors. There was a rule that in principle, nuclear reactors would only be used for 40 years as a result of nu the nuclear disaster, but they are trying to um, change that and switch that over to the Electricity Business Act with uh, more lenient um, conditions. And so this is very shocking and concerning. And uh, as I mentioned, these the Atomic Energy Basic Law will be ch changed and what that actually means is that if this is not something that has just happened now but nuclear the nuclear industry is not economically feasible it has relied heavily on funding from the government and the Atomic Energy Regulation Association has also is also created by the government, and uh, everything that they do it costs the country money as well. But and so if we do if they do nothing, the nuclear industry would probably uh, fade out as it is not able to compete with other sources. And so they're do the government is doing everything they can to keep promoting nuclear power. Up until now, the strategic energy plan stated that it would reduce dependence on nuclear power as much as possible. And that the 
and the uh, minister had said that new nuclear power plants were not currently envisioned, but since then they have turned, it, they've changed course. And I think that this is part of the shock doctrine when something extremely uh, concerning happens, people go into shock. For example, there's the war in Ukraine, soaring energy and fuel prices, the depreciation of the yen. And so it's very expensive to import uh, fuel into Japan. And so electricity prices are also soaring. And so there's a sense of crisis amongst people. And so the people who have been trying to sneak back into nuclear power feel that that is an, uh, an opening for them. And at the end of August last year, they changed the operation period of nuclear reactors and the construction and decommissioning related policies. And uh, after four months, the GX policy draft was created. And after another month, they uh, called for public comments. And after that, the GX basic policy uh, was um, passed. But nuclear power doesn't act, nuclear reactors won't actually help to resolve any of these issues. Uh, as mentioned from our previous speaker, uh, uranium is imported in order to uh, operate nuclear power and uranium is extremely problematic and it's, it cannot be uh, produced domestically, but for some reason, nuclear power is considered to be a form of producing energy within Japan. And uh, the war in Ukraine has reminded us of the dangers of nuclear power. If war takes place, it is one of the places that would be targeted. But uh, the government has turned a blind eye on that aspect. And they're saying that uh, this is a way to provide stable and safe energy. But nuclear power in reality is very unstable. The Fukushima disaster has proven that to us. And even before that, nuclear power plants have caused many issues and uh, lots of companies have tried to hide those. And there's been lots of scandal um, around that. And technologically, it's also not stable. If a nuclear power plant uh, stops, it would cause uh, unstable supply demand. Right now, uh, we should adjust with what we have and also strengthen the infrastructure for renewable energy sources to become the main source of energy. Um, as you can see from this bar graph, it shows the percentage of electricity generated from various sources. The black is nuclear power and the pink line is the CO2 emissions from the energy sector. Even as nuclear power plants increase, the CO2 emissions are also increasing. The consumption does lead to more CO2 emissions. Uh, on the other hand, after the nuclear uh, Fukushima disaster, uh, nuclear power plants were at zero at one point, and even since some have restarted, it is still smaller. There is, and uh, the electricity CO2 emissions have decreased slightly, but that is because of the increase in uh, renewable energy and the slight decrease in the consumption. So in Japan, since the disaster, 
uh, for more than 10 years, there were zero nuclear power plants in operation. It's hard to uh, put all of the different issues and scandals that took place into this one image because there have been so many. So if you look at the in global uh, movement, lots of renewable energy has increased. Yellow is solar power. Uh, green is wind power and nuclear power is the, the black one, the black line. So you can see that the price has risen. It's the most expensive source of energy at this point because of construction costs. For a single reactor, prices could be from one to two trillion yen for, and not just construction, but also maintenance fees and safety costs. For example, Kashiwazaki Kariwa plant in Japan. Sorry about that. Uh, the safety budget for Kashiwazaki Kariwa is over 1 trillion yen. And so it really costs so much to maintain nuclear power plants. And so uh, the fact that people are saying that nuclear power is cheaper is a complete uh, lie. Uh, they've also said that uh, one other issue is that the nuclear fuel cycle has already collapsed and the Rokkasho reprocessing plant uh, has had various issues. And before even going into operation, it is already um, be proven to be unstable and so there's no there are no benefits from using this it creates extremely dangerous high levels of radioactive liquid and generates plutonium and it creates mox fuel which which produces spent mox fuel which cannot be processed in Japan. And this spent MOX fuel uh, emits a lot of heat. And so it needs to be cooled for over 300 years in one location before being able to move it, which is extremely uh, difficult to handle. And so it seems almost idiotic to even try to use this system. If we operate the Rokkasho reprocessing plant, um, immeasurable amounts of radioactive materials would be um, emitted into our environment. And so, uh, as I mentioned earlier, nuclear power plants won't help to resolve the supply demand crunch of electricity. Uh, FOE has posted about this on our website. So please go ahead and take a look at that with or without nuclear power plants. Last year, we had a, a energy crunch. What is needed is an adjustment in the way in which power is supplied and nuclear power is very, uh, it is not a flexible form of power and so there's um, a similar situation would have occurred even if we had had nuclear power plants operational. And so going back to the, the bundle of bills I mentioned earlier, please appeal to your local legislators um, to oppose this. If you're not um, comfortable with making a phone call, please write them a letter. There are a lot of issues, but one of the major ones is the uh, extension of the operation period of nuclear power plants. Uh, various media have been reporting on this, but one aspect that maybe hasn't been mentioned as much is that earlier there, uh, until now, the operation period was regulated under the uh, nuclear reactor regulation the act on the regulation of nuclear reactors but it has that right is being transferred to the 
Electricity Business Act. And there's a provision that would allow for the exemption of shutdown periods. Another issue is that Medi is the one that would approve of this. For example, uh, there are different cases in which exemptions may be allowed, but Medi would be the one deciding on that, which means that Medi is the uh, the ministry that wants to use nuclear power, and so they they might say no in some cases to maintain appearances, but for the most part, it would be beneficial for them to approve of a lot of these exemptions. And if we look at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and what they've been doing, It is questionable whether or not where their uh, loyalties lie, and it does not seem that it is with the victims and the people who have been affected. In principle, the operation period was 40 years. And that was the basis of this uh, rule in the first place, but the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has allowed these very old nuclear reactors to continue operating beyond the originally decided upon period of 40 years. And so I, th I think it's very hard to trust these organizations to uh, um, function in the way that they need to. So the uh, operation period for nuclear power plants would be changed and move to the Electricity uh, Business Act. So Goshi Hosono was the minister in charge at the time when this was decided. He has moved on to a different post since then. But uh, at the time, he was the minister of the environment. And if you look at what he said at the diet when he was speaking about this, uh, he said that we arrived at the figure of 40 years after taking into account the service life of each piece of equipment in operation. For example, if you look at an electrical product or a car, none of them are still relevant to this day. And so that's what his explanation was. And as Kozano san said so very eloquently that was the 40-year period was decided as a safety measure which is obvious however the nuclear regulatory commission decided that this was not necessary and has um, decided to change that rule there was one person one member of the nuclear regulatory commission who is a geologist, uh, Ishiwatari, who opposed, he said that uh, the operation period would be extended. And so he opposed this, but that was on February 8th. And two days later on February 10th, it was approved. Uh, and also to just share what we were doing on February 9th, FOE Japan and 22 other organizations in Japan, we expressed our opposition and we collected uh, 75,000 uh, signatures in our petition. I think that's a very big number and submitted this to the government. But on the following day, it was approved. And 3,966 public comments were submitted as well. And most of those, a lot of them were voices of opposition, but the government did not um, listen to these voices. However, uh, we can't stay silent. There's a lot that we can still do. We 
do have uh, rights in this democracy. We have representatives that are supposed to be um, representing us. So I encourage you to lobby your congressmen and women and to appeal to them to oppose GX related laws. You can call them, you can send them a fax, an email, anything. If possible, try visiting your local offices, local government offices. It might seem a little scary at first, but if you can visit their office and tell them directly about how you oppose, that would be wonderful. And you can also create a petition or appeal to submit to your local municipal assembly. It depends possibly on what your local government is like, but it would be great if you can contact your legislators and ask them what is possible. And so if your local municipality can also um, voice their thoughts and oppose, then that would be great. Or you can hold some sort of debate or meeting where people can voice their opinions or any sort of uh, event where people can uh, raise their voices. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Ms. Mitsta. Yes, I think there's still a lot that we can do. And so let's share our ideas on how to take action. So from here, uh, we are moving on to the last part, the second half of the second part of the symposium. I know that we've been listening to various people talk for two hours. So please, uh, you know, relax and stretch your body a bit. We have six uh, people who will be participating in this relay talk portion. First one is a message from overseas. I'll be playing a video and um, other people will be joining via Zoom or some are uh, at the venue today. First, uh, we have a video message from Xu Zi of the Taiwan Green Citizens Action Alliance. So please watch this video. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really fortunate to speak here today and to share with you. Goehao,我是台湾绿色公民行动联盟的代表,崔树新。今天要跟大家报告台湾反核运动的现况。台湾目前有四个核电厂。那第一核电厂已经在2019年7月的时候正式废炉了 永和派所提起的公投，但是仍然没有成功，持续的停止。因此，我们的期待是希望台湾在2025年之前能够达成非核的家园。要达成这个目标，必须要第一，台湾现有的核电厂不再继续演绎，也不再新建新的核电厂。
抗议日本政府排放福岛核污水的行动。在二零二二年的八月，我们就已经响应国际联署，在台湾号召团体一起加入，并且在日台交流协会前面提交公开信，发起抗议的行动。我们认为排放核污水可能会造成海洋环境的威胁，也会违反国际法。日本政府应该撤回排放核污水到太平洋的计划。提出不会造成环境危害的储存或处理方案，但遗憾的是，二零二三年的一月十三号，我们听到日本政府决议要在春季到夏季将福岛核污水排入大海，无视国际社会的反对跟质疑。因此，台湾的民间团体对此表达强烈的遗憾跟谴责，我们也发布了抗议的声明，也进行了反对的活动。今年是俄罗斯入侵乌克兰的战争满了一周年。在去年开战之初，我们就已经举办了记者会，声援乌克兰，反对俄罗斯的核威胁。在今年满一周年的前夕，我们同样也召开声援乌克兰的记者会。台湾的公民团体团结在一起，我们提出了几点诉求。第一，我们认为俄罗斯应该停止入侵乌克兰的军事行动。停止攻击核电厂，还有相关核废料的储存设施，避免一切在核电厂周围的武装冲突。第二，我们谴责俄罗斯在入侵乌克兰战争引发核污染的巨大风险与危机。第三，我们呼吁俄罗斯以及拥有核武的国家都应自治并停止核武的威胁，保障全球人类的生存。目前，我们看台湾反核运动有几下一些挑战。第一，乌克兰与俄罗斯的战争导致全球核灾风险升高，核电厂在战争中成为军事攻击的目标。台湾也有面临战争的可能性，所以更应停止核电，使台湾远离核能的风险。支持核电派的人士以乌俄战争、燃料价格上涨为理由，主张核电厂延役，甚至推动新的核能技术。但事实上，战争反而加速了欧洲的能源转型。去年，法国的老旧核能机组常常停机，导致发电量减少了百分之十三。最后是由再生能源补足发电缺口，让欧盟因应天然气缺乏的状况。在二零二二年的时候，欧盟的风力与光电合计占比已经高过了核能，甚至也超越了天然气。因此，我们认为应该持续推动无核以及转向再生能源。面对未来气候变迁以及战争的风险，这是不只是台湾反核运动的挑战，我们相信也是全球反核运动的挑战。亚洲的反核的情势息息相关，不管韩国、日本、台湾、中国，我们都看到，的确有核能复兴的浪潮正在兴起。我们希望能跟大家一起持续努力团结，能够继续倡议反核运动的理念。早日达成亚洲无核的未来，谢谢大家。Thank you very much. Next is a video message from Jan Varode of FOE Germany. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really fortunate to speak here today and to share with you some insights about the ongoing debate on nuclear power in Germany, as well as the importance of remembering the severe disaster of the Fukushima accident. My name is Jan Varode and I work for Friends of the Earth Germany as a campaigner against nuclear power. The Russian war on Ukraine that started last year in February shocked us all and all our thoughts and memories are with the people on the Ukraine right now. However, the war also led to a debate on uh, energy policy, not only in Europe, but also in Germany. Because Germany was highly dependent on Russian gas, and in 2021, nearly 60% of the imported gas came from Russia. This, is, uh, this gas is needed to um, heat up private homes, and so the concern arose with an import stop of Russian gas, uh, these houses and flats could remain cold. 
However, the debate didn't stop there and a lot of politics, politicians linked the debate on gas shortages to shortages in electricity, electricity and even painted the picture and scenario of a blackout. Uh, we know and a lot of scientists could also show that um, this fear is totally false and we never have the situation of energy shortages or heating shortages or even blackouts in Germany. However, um, the nuclear was back on the table and a lot of uh, politicians uh, saw this as a solution. So we know now and uh, we know then that nuclear is always a false solution. Even the Liberal Party, uh, which is involved in the current government, came out in favor of a lifetime expansion of the nuclear power in Germany. And this all happens in 2022, which uh, was supposed to be the year of the final phase out of uh, German nuclear power plants. In 2011, uh, when the severe disaster of Fukushima happened, Angela Merkel decided to phase out the German power plants gradually. And so at the beginning of 2022, only three reactors were up and running. So the whole debate and the whole discussion here in Germany revolved around these three power plants with around 6% uh, of the uh, German energy mix. It is absurd that we in Germany discuss the continue of uh, operation of nuclear power plants while at the same time Russian attack and nearly hit uh, Ukrainian nuclear power plants. Even Germany is not safe from terror and war and the sooner we get rid of the potential danger and risks of nuclear power plants, the better. Nuclear power has really no future. Um, so the debate about nuclear power, which was conducted, as I said, without any hard facts, led to a big uh, media outlet and uh, big public attention. So in um, the end of 2022, Olaf Scholz decided to withdraw the nuclear phase out and decided to let the three um, remaining power plants run until mid of April 2023. Nevertheless, the debate didn't stop there and uh, more and more voices are getting louder for uh, voting for nuclear power. So um, there were uh, ideas of letting them run until 25 or even building new uh, nuclear power plants. Politicians, the media and some parts of the um, public uh, forget about the severe dangers and risks of nuclear power. Nuclear power or accidents of nuclear power plants could also happen in Germany, and the risk of that uh, increases because of the age of our nuclear power plants. Also, knowing that the nuclear phase out will take place, um, a lot of operators um, stopped uh, important safety checks and um, uh, also cost intensive uh, upgrades. In recent years, inspectors and operators found cracks in the heating system of the nuclear power plants, and these cracks are safety relevant and could cause a core meltdown if these uh, pipes burst. So this brings back memories of the Fukushima nuclear di disaster, and a lot of people in Germany feel the same. Um, this spring, many people in Germany will therefore demonstrate against nuclear power here and worldwide. Change is needed now more than ever. This is why we demand a 100% renewable energy in Germany and worldwide. For us, as friends of the Earth, the so-called energy vendor is a keystone for the future energy production. However, the last couple of years, um, the government slept in, on building new wind turbines and solar power plants and forgot about energy efficiency and energy savings. So there's a lot of things to do and we need a more social and ecological transition without uh, nuclear and fossil fuel, of course. So on this year's March 11th, um, hundreds of people plan demonstration and vigils all over Germany. You can find these um, demonstrations on our website and um, the message is now never clear. Uh, nuclear power is dangerous and we don't need nuclear power for uh, uh, future. 
So the legacy and the commemoration of the severe disaster at the Fukushima power plant warns us to stand up for a nuclear-free and renewable future. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, we've heard from Taiwan, people from Taiwan, as well as Germany. And next, we will hear from Saiko Uno, who evacuated from Fukushima to Kyoto. Uh, Ms. Uno is connected with us via Zoom. Over to you, Ms. Uno. Hello, everybody. Good evening. My name is Sayoko Uno. Thank you for this opportunity to speak today. 12 years ago in Fukushima, the nuclear power plant in Fukushima Daiichi was about to reach the end of its 40 year operational period. I was working with my colleagues to start an initiative to talk about the issue of decommissioning old nuclear power plants and the resulting contamination and waste and the need for a society that is not dependent on nuclear power. I was calling on people to join us to discuss and think together about decommissioning and a future without nuclear power. However, Daiichi nuclear power plant, the first reactor exploded before the end of its 40-year operational period. And many, many people were killed in the disaster, were killed in the tsunami, suffered through the evacuation. Over these 12 years, many things have happened. And we talked about a lot during today's event, how the responsibility for the accident is being concealed, how the continued suffering of victims is being concealed, how there are many people who suffered from illness, who have died following the disaster. The social structure required to protect people from radiation should have been put into place after the accident. However, it hasn't. The law that was put in place to protect people's health and livelihoods from the accident has not been properly used. when organizations that are trying to help victims try and get funding, they are no longer able to receive funding. People in temporary housing are being forced to leave the temporary housing. There's bullying, there is depression, there's PTSD. There's all this hardship, but we have managed to survive with hope and solidarity. Lives have been destroyed, livelihoods have been destroyed, ecosystems have been destroyed. And based on these, I believe that the GX policy announced by Kishida's administration is wrong. This policy is going to destroy the future of Japan, if we allow it to be implemented, everybody who lives on in Japan, on this planet, and future generations will suffer if the GX is implemented. We need to protect our planet so that it can continue to be home to life, so that people 100, 200 years from now can live in happiness, we must address climate change with real solutions and we mustn't 
We must be prepared for the next earthquake. I will continue to do what I can as a victim of the disaster. Please, let's keep working together, join hands together. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Uno. Uh, next, we will hear from Ms. Has Masami Hino, who is the director of the plaintiffs group for the Onagawa nuclear power plant restart lawsuit. Uh, they are also participating via Zoom. Thank you. My name is Hino. I am director of the Association of Plaintiffs for the suspension of the restart of the Onagawa nuclear power plant. The Onagawa nuclear plant just managed to survive the earthquake and disaster. And since then, we have been doing everything we can to stop it from risking any future disasters. We collected many, many petitions to stop the, to oppose the restarting. However, this was dismissed by the opposition, part, by, the, by the government. Following that, the Iwaki citizens and the mayor of Ishino made an appeal to Sendai local courts. However, the, based on the fact that the evacuation plan was not effective, however, this was also dismissed by the local courts. Following that, we the the Miyagi prefecture that was also we have been working up until now very hard to use any legal routes available to us and in May 2021, 17 citizens of Ishinomaki filed a lawsuit against TEPCO saying that the evacuation plan was ineffective and that they mustn't restart the nuclear power plant with an ineffective evacuation plan. For a, a year and a half after that, the court case went on and it was concluded at the end of last year and the Decision will be delivered this year in May. During the court case, we have been talking about how the evacuation plan is not effective, how there's problems with possible traffic jams and radiation, and how we cannot set up testing centers to test the radiation how we do not have enough buses for the evacuation, all these bits of evidence to prove how the evacuation plan is not effective. In response to this, TEPCO has replied that we haven't proved the risk of a nuclear accident. They say that it's safe and there's no real danger and also claim that they have the government's approval and keep up with this stance. We have asked for 90 open hearings to learn about the details of what they have been planning in terms of the evacuation plan. And we have made clear in the court case that it's not a proper or effective evacuation plan. Finally, Miyagi Prefecture started to take some notice of our work and set up a smartphone application to be used during the evacuation. And they have the 
Tipka has also agreed to try supply 3 billion yen to maintain the roads that will be used during the evacuation. The roads around the nuclear power plant have been having work done on them and they're planning to restart the power plant next year, this year. So if we win in our lawsuit, we hope that we can stop Kishida administration's GX movement to restart nuclear power. In Sendai, we are holding an assembly to oppose the restarting of nuclear power plants and raise awareness of, amongst the public. And we will do everything we can to stop the restart of the Onagawa nuclear power plant. We ask for your support and attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hino-san. Finally, we have Ueta, Mr. Ryo Ueta from Fridays for Future Tokyo. He is joining us here in the venue today. Over to you, Mr. Ueta. Hello, everyone. I am representing Fridays for Future Tokyo. My name is Ryo Ueta. Fridays for Future usually advocates for climate change, but Today, I would like to talk about climate change in relation to nuclear power. As many of you have probably seen from media, we have already seen a lot of damages as a result of climate change happening worldwide. And if we keep going as is, or with the current policies that we have in a few years or in a few decades, we will see damages that are tens of hundreds of times more severe than what we've already seen. And so we cannot sit back and live in this current situation. We feel um, we need to act urgently. And as Mitsuda-san mentioned, Earlier, the Japanese government is pushing forward with the GX policy and it seems as though they're moving towards a, a green transformation, but that is not actually the case. The climate crisis, in order to minimize the effects of the climate crisis, we need to take immediate action. However, nuclear power, it does not uh, emit greenhouse gases in, when in operation, but when uh, constructing the power plants, when uh, extracting uranium, and when decommissioning the plant, it emits a lot of uh, greenhouse gases. And it is something that takes a lot of time to build, and so it is not a short-term decarbonization solution. And there was a lot of discussion about the aging of these nuclear power plants. A lot of the parts that are used are very old, which means that uh, further incidents and disasters can take place. And if that is the case, then a lot of those plants will be halted once again and so they would not be a source of stable energy supply the government says that 20 to 22 percent of electricity should be supplied by nuclear power in 2023 if there is an issue that takes place and nuclear power plants aren't able to operate as scheduled then we would have to use coal firepower to supply the amounts that are needed, which would um, contribute further to climate change. I would also like to speak a little bit about the public comments. There were four public comments um, happening, revolving around nuclear power and GX. 
uh, normally public comments are used to incorporate citizens' opinions into policies and to use it as a feedback mechanism. However, in, with regards to GX basic policy or the uh, continued operation of power plants, this public comment happened at, at the end of the year and it seemed as if they had no, um, they weren't planning on actually listening to our voices. As Muto-san and Kumazawa-san mentioned, whenever there is a disaster, it leaves both physical and psychological scars on victims, even after many years even after a dec more than a decade has passed, um, they're still facing these consequences. And so there are so many issues that are unresolved. Even with safety precautions, there is a always a possibility that another disaster will take place. And there are different ways to produce energy like renewable energy and nuclear power is much more expensive than those. Also, we need to uh, store nuclear waste for hundreds of years afterward, and that is another issue that we do not have a solution to. And so trying to use nuclear power as a solution for emitting less global, uh, less greenhouse gases is a direct violation of climate justice. And so us at Fridays for Future, we leave that we shouldn't rely on fossil fuels or nuclear power and to shift towards an actually green energy transformation. That's all for me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ueta. And to everyone who participated in today's relay talk portion, uh, I. I think we were able to hear from people around the world who are fighting for the same goals and we're really grateful that you shared your voices with us today. I hope that we can continue to connect with one another and continue our activities and advocacy in solidarity. Uh, our symposium is coming to an end very soon. Uh, and so I would like to ask Mitsuta from FOA Japan for some closing remarks. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It was a, quite a long session. Following what we have talked about today, I think you will all have realized that when we're talking about nuclear power, it's not purely about energy. It's about respect for people. It's about right to life. It's about something that threatens these. That's what I felt. After the nuclear accident, children have got thyroid cancer. We were able to hear directly from these people today. We must see this issue as our own problem, not someone else's problem. And Leona today, she shared with us about the battles that the indigenous peoples have been facing, about the uranium mining, what they're facing, the pollution. We were also able to hear from Leona about that. We see electricity as something that's always available, that we can always use. And uh, I think we need to really think about how we've been living our lives or we've been taking electricity for granted in a way. Going forward, we must use it very preciously. Now, both Japan and the world are facing a huge crisis. There's war, there's conflict. Democracy is also facing a crisis. 
And this issue of energy is about how we can get the future that we want, how that we can decide our own future. Everything that I heard from everybody who joined us today, I think it's really important that we treasure these connections and we work together to get a future without nuclear power where we can live in safety and peace. Thank you very much. Thank you everybody today for joining us. We've had about 300 people in the venue, over 200 people joining us online. It's been great to have so many people with us today. Thank you very much. We had two interpreters also joining us today, Ms. Yoshika and Ms. Omura. Thank you very much for your interpreting. And finally, I would like to say thank you to all our speakers today. And I would also like to thank everyone who joined, the staff members, and those are the people who weren't able to make it here today, but are always doing their best to further this cause. I'd also like to show my support and solidarity for them. And just before we finish, I would like to make a call for some donations. Peace Boat, who is one of the co-organizers of this event, is doing emergency relief work for the earthquake in Turkey. Please share the link in the chat for more details. We also have at FOE, we are doing a project to support families and children from Fukushima. We would very much welcome your donations for that project as well. We are handing out envelopes to collect your donations. If you would like to specify how the donation should be used, please also write that on the envelope such as for FOE for Green for Peace Boat. We also have a questionnaire. Please fill out the questionnaire and share your thoughts about the event with us. Thank you very much everybody for staying with us and we look forward to seeing you again at the next event. Thank you very much.